First up, I'm glad that I'm right before lunch because it gives enough time for people to have had enough alcohol that any screw-ups that I have in this talk will be mitigated. Uh, how many people are fans of beer? If you don't raise your hand and you're at this conference, I'm a little confused. Okay. Uh, now, how many people are into making their own beer and home brewing? Okay. Not a huge amount, but that's okay. I'm prepared to give you a four-hour lecture on how home brewing works and how fantastic it is, but unfortunately, they've only given me 30 minutes. So, let's begin. I, as mentioned, am Andrew Nordman, and I like two main things. One, Ruby. Ruby is great. Beer. Beer is great. So what happens when you combine Ruby and beer? There's only one possible picture that can describe how I feel about my two passions. <laughs> that is it. That is it right there. Um, so what I want to talk about, and part of the reason why I did all of this, is uh, I started homebrewing in 2010. A friend of mine said, hey, you need to start making beer. I said, hey, I don't like beer. He said, OK, uh, here, start making beer. I was very confused as to why someone that told me that, I, uh, that knows that I don't like beer wanted me to make it, and I made my first batch. It was terrible. I made my second batch. It was also terrible. Finally, on the third batch, I finally realized that, hey, there's more to this than just throwing a few things together and hoping that at the end something doesn't taste terrible. So I really started getting into the process of home brewing and how you make beer, and I found that it is a beautiful uh, combination of what I do in programming, and I just immediately got hooked onto it and actually, as of last year, started up my own brewing company, Cadman Brewing Company. Um, we are a nanoscale brewery. What that means is we make less than uh, seven barrels per batch, which is 217 gallons at a time. Uh, much larger micro scale stuff will do at least that, if not considerably more. And we're actually uh, in process of uh, getting our licensing to actually be able to sell anything. So all I can do is sit around making beer and working on recipes. It's a terrible, terrible task, but I am up for the challenge. So, craft brewing is a blending of art and science. You have the art on, and creativity of creating these recipes and taking just a single concept or a few key characteristics of a particular recipe or an idea, and then you, you blend that into the science of extracting your sugars and being able to have the final result come out in a reprodu reproducible fashion. So what I ended up doing was implementing all of this automation side. And uh, let me back up. So one of the main problems that you have when dealing with recipe design is you need to be able to consistently monitor what you're doing when you're making a batch. If I put in the same ingredients uh, both uh, in two different batches, and I want the same recipe, I need to be able to control all of the human error because we are bad at doing things and being able to, re to reproduce. So what did I do when I normally uh, have problems of having to reproduce things? I automated it. So one of the things that I did was take a Raspberry Pi, which I had sitting around because I said, hey, cool, I want a Raspberry Pi. It's $35 for a computer. I picked one up initially and said, great, what the hell do I do with a computer this small that doesn't do anything? So I started writing some software in order to help brew it. And the, one of the, thing, the initial responses I had when I started talking to people about this was, why a Raspberry Pi over something like an Arduino? You're handling lower level mechanics, and, uh, and you, you should be focusing on lower level stuff like Arduinos that can handle temperature integrations and things like that. And the main answer is, Arduinos are expensive, Raspberry Pis are cheap, and I like Ruby. And you can't write Ruby on an Arduino directly. So now that that slide is completely out of order and I can get back to how it should actually have been, we're going to talk about what it takes to go from coming up with an idea on a beer to finishing a beer and being able to drink it. First thing you have to do is create a recipe. Recipes are basically coming up with a certain style, a characteristic. I want to make a ridiculous IPA that blows my mouth away every time. Or I want a really bitter, dark beer that reminds me of s'mores, something like that. And then you start picking in your grains, your hops, your water profile, your yeasts, all of these things that blend together and uh, create that final product. Then you start planning how it's going to ferment, what the temperatures are going to be like, so that the yeast that's going to be converting all those sugars into alcohol 
can operate at maximum capacity, and then you carbonate that sucker, because flat beer doesn't taste good. So one way that software has already been able to help improve making recipes is a software called Beersmith. What it does is it takes a lot of the science of how, much your, uh, how many sugars you're gonna get out of a particular batch, and based on your equipment uh, rates and how, how everything, how you're making your beer, what you can expect. And a lot of people think that uh, Beersmith is a little primitive, uh, but at the end of the day, there's just there's way too much math that has been put into software that helps design recipes for me to really want to turn around and reinvent the wheel. As you'll see, there's a lot of other tech that I've already had to write on my own. Recreating Beersmith was just not on the list. So the next thing when you're creating recipes is you need had to have a lot of notes. You need to take a look at every time that you're making a batch, how much, uh, what's, what the flavors are like, what sort of temperature variations you have. Um, the main things that you're dealing with, both as you're brewing and as you're fermenting, is consistency in temperature and in duration. So being able to take notes saying, on this particular batch, I had tem temperatures drop by five degrees, and as a result, the flavors are a little off. Or, my, the the uh, yeast ended up fermenting a little too aggressively, things of that nature. And then you need to be able to look at individual batches and how that reflects recipes so that you can have uh, further iterations on that. You're essentially treating your recipes like your applications and your equipment that allows you to brew as your servers. You're actively monitoring and engaging how, how effective your equipment is and then compensating for that for how your uh, recipes and how you're brewing and how you're making your beer. And seriously, I cannot n mention enough, log everything, log everything. I have talked to brewers and all they'll end up writing from when they make a particular batch is how, uh, how long it took them and if something, some major cataclysmic thing happened like, oh, I happened to dump all the beer on the floor. And that's it as far as what they've written down. That does not help at all, especially when you're trying to create recipes, when you're trying to expand out and be able to do your own thing rather than re, uh, taking other people's recipes, uh, careful notes are important. So what I ended up doing is doing, is creating a new application called Brew Lab. What it does is it create, where it picks up where Beersmith left, leaves off, wherein Beersmith creates your recipes, you get the general high concept, and this is what's, what's gonna happen. What it doesn't do is look at how individual batches work and how you're going to, uh, what happened when you're making the beer, what adjustments you made. Because you may find that on batch number seven, you've made enough tweaks that you really don't like the direction that you're going. You really like batch number four, but what did you really do in batch number four and what changes did you have between those batches that impacted whether you liked it or didn't like it? So what it ends up doing is uh, it imports Beersmith recipes. It uh, associates those batch, it keeps, keeps the idea of batches with recipes rather than just creating a new recipe and making tweaks. And if you want to make another recipe or another derivation of the recipe, you're creating a whole new recipe. And it stores all of your times, your temperatures, and all of that notation for you. So you have an easy way to be able to take a look at uh, that reference information. But most importantly, it also has an API that allows it to integrate with your brewing equipment. So, of course, if you've, you have a system that allows you to integrate uh, with your brewing equipment, now you need to have the ability to make fancy pants uh, equipment that automatically sends information to your lab, which I have out of order. <sighs> so initially, uh, in order to be able to pull in from Beersmith, I created Brewscribe. And this is currently open source. And what it does is it actually takes the exported files from Beersmith and, uh, and imports them into straight Ruby objects. If you can see a code sample there. It's basically uh, pulling out a particular Beersmith file, and uh, now you have access to start manipulating and pulling that information in. From there, it allows BrewLab to be able to take that information and create it within its own within its Rails application. So, brew in a batch. This is an awesome picture with used with the Mac equivalent of MS Paint, but it thoroughly describes the overall process of brewing. You. What we're, what we're looking at here is what's called a heat, ex, a heat exchange recirculated mash system, or HERMS, 
which uses three vessels in order to, to operate. The basic flow is you put some water in that left tank, and that little red thing is a, a heating element, and the little gray thing that's swirled around is actually a stainless steel coil. And you put your grain in the middle one, with, and the little slotted thing at the bottom there is a filter. And what you end up doing is you heat up some water in the first tank, you then pump it over into your mash tun where, where all your grain is located, and you just let it recirculate. And temperature sensors will actually pick up the information, pick up the, te the current rate of the liquid as it's coming out of the mash liquor tun before it hits the pump. And says, okay, given this information, I need to increase the heat of the water in the hot liquor tank by five degrees. And as a result, it will automatically calibrate and maintain an even heat of the liquid as it's recirculating. And what that's really doing is called the mash process. Uh, that's the, the first two vessels in, in the system. And what that's doing is that's extracting the sugars from the grains that you're putting into there and uh, allowing it to turn into a nice uh, It combines with the water itself and creates that nice sweet wort, which is what happens before you add yeast. It gets really delicious. And that takes about 60 to 90 minutes. So being able to automate that process so that you're maintaining an even temperature for that long of a period of time is important and uh, a great opportunity for, uh, for Ruby to come into play. Finally, you have the boiling process, which if I back it back up to here, after you've recirculated for your 60 to 90 minutes in the middle tank, you pump over to the third vessel all the way on the right, which is the boil kettle. You heat up all that liquid, you create a, a reduction to the per your desired concentration. That is the point where you start adding in your hops for all that bitterness and aroma goodness. And then you pump that off into your fermenter, add in your yeast, and wait around because beer takes a while before it actually is ready to drink. So the boiling process, uh, that's, this is where you get all of the individual uh, hop additions, your, your flavorants, and has a, a great time for automation as well because you need to keep that beer at a rolling boil for the entire duration because it helps remove some of the chemicals that uh, cause off flavors into your beer. If you've ever had a beer that has a little bit of a, uh, a sweet corn type smell to it uh, or a little bit of a tinge like that, that's a sign that it hasn't had a, a consistent enough boil and you need to, it, that they needed to keep that boiling going on for a bit longer. So here we have another perfect opportunity to be able to start automating the process. And so I created Bruby. Bruby currently runs on MRI 1.9. I'm in the process now that uh, MRB Gems has been moved into MRuby. Uh, I've been porting it over to there using some of the, the new extensions to add in file I.O. and things of that nature. It handles Herms or another version of brewing called RIMS where instead of having a separate tank, it just runs through a pipe that has that hot water, uh, the, the water heating element inside of it. And it runs directly off of the Raspberry Pi with just a very small expansion board with relay and sensor connectors. Um, I brought said expansion board with me and then the TSA managed to break it. So, I don't have a fancy little thing about this big to show you, but if you imagine, it's about this big, it's great, it's got little connectors on it, but the main thing is that it's running entirely off of Raspberry Pi's GPIO uh, ports. It uses the one-wire one protocol and Dallas DS18B20 temperature sensors to read in the data, and then it outputs to uh, solid-state relays that control the water heater elements themselves. So, as a result, you get constant and continuous movement. It also operates off of a touchscreen GUI, which uh, looks like that. Here's our, our hardware. We've got, uh, it's a 16 by 8 by 8 control panel with a nice touchscreen display, a keypad on the side for additional information, and funny toggle switches so that uh, I don't actually shock myself because this does run on 240 volt 30 amp power running into the thing. So if you are not a licensed electrician and you are interested in doing something like this, have a friend do it. Preferably a friend that you don't have a problem with suddenly going to the hospital with. <laughs> and uh, sure, you and I have different opinions on friends. So here's the, uh, the picture of my current system. It, uh, it, it ain't much, but it's good. 
and it, it's how I work on uh, all of my recipe designs. So you see our three kettles and all of our little uh, attachments. Bumping back up. So um, using the touch screen GUI, one of the problems that you immediately run into is that if you want to do GUI development with Ruby, you're in for a bad time. Uh, you're basically dealing with wrapping around other systems. And I actually started out just using Gosu in order to pretend that it works like a game and uh, knocked it out that way for uh, touch events. But I realized that one, that doesn't work all that well. Two, I didn't think I could uh, move it over to MRB very easily. And three, that's a lot of intensity on the Raspberry Pi. So what I actually did instead is wrote uh, one of the benefits of Raspberry Pi is that it actually comes with its own OpenGL ES uh, headers built, uh, shipped with the operating system. So I wrote a, a wrapper around OpenGL uh, yes, so it actually runs through the command line, but boots up and runs the entire thing through OpenGL. Uh, talk about super hacks in order to make a basic system work, but it functions, and it allows me to not have to run X in order to have a nice touch screen system. So the way that it actually handles temperature control is by running a PID-based uh, PID temperature management system I wrote called Temper. And it's it takes the basic PID algorithm that you would find in Arduino, essentially, and ports it over to Ruby. Uh, I open sourced it about 10 days ago. It's, it, it works pretty decently, and it also operates um, bi-directional, so you can actually reuse it not only for heating, but also for cooling and uh, dual-stage fermentation, uh, dual-stage temperature control. So if you wanted to have uh, sloping between uh, hot and cold to help mitigate your jumps and spikes, it has that op capability as well. Uh, so what this does is temper is being is put into Ruby and uses it to read in the sensor data. As you can see here, uh, the, if you're unfamiliar with the PID algorithm, what it does is it uses uh, the proportional integral and derivative uh, readings on it, pulls in the input sensor data, and then uses time between the last between the last reading check, and then automatically calibrates. So in this system, we create a, uh, a new PID based uh, off of temper. We tune it. Um, it un unfortunately, I have not extracted out the, the auto-tuning system that is in Bruby into Temper. That's something I'm hoping to have done in the next, I'd say, week or so, is getting that set up. And then you just use a simple while loop to read in your sensor data, and it automatically calibrates based on the time since last reading uh, how much power needs to be out. So for the purposes here, it takes the, the sensor data in, it says, okay, between zero and 1,000, which is its inter interval here, uh, that rates into a percentage of power. So however many milliseconds, uh, the, whatever the output is for, the con for temperature control, that's how many milliseconds per second that the heater should be on. So if the, in this instance, if the output is uh, 700, then that means 700 milliseconds in every uh, 1,000 milliseconds, the heater will be on, and it will actually buffer the beginning and end so that it's consistent on and off between cycles. So the other things that Ruby needs to integrate is in order to handle temperature control for boiling, you can't just set, I want 212.5 degrees Fahrenheit and hope that you're going to get the boil, pro the boil rate that you want. You need manual intervention in order to make it run. So what we use is uh, pulse width management, uh, pulse width modulation to do a, using the same process as I'd mentioned for auto, only using the keypad, you're able to say, I want 90% power, I want 20% power, and easily switch it up so that now it's boiling at whatever rate you're choosing. So it's, it's not full automation in that sense, you're still having to monitor, but it's a considerable better bet than just looking at a thermometer and saying, um, let me tweak the power just a little bit. And more importantly, it also is pulling recipes from BrewLab. So the system actually, you, don't, you, you tell it either your brew, the BrewLab connection information or you load a uh, Beersmith file onto the Raspberry Pi itself. And the screen, the first thing that you end up seeing is, here's every recipe that Bruby knows about. Are you going to make a new batch one of these or find a file that's on the system to do it? And then if you're using BrewLab, uh, in the system, it actually sends the data back up to the API so that you're getting all of that data up for review later. 
So you get real-time look from the screen as well as later uh, referential for monitoring and tweaking and decide, hey, my equipment has a problem. Let's start tweaking things. So as mentioned, that's what the control panel looks like. It's all pretty when it's you know, in real life instead of the digital representation. Uh, so operation is, is basically all that has to happen from a manual uh, process in order to make beer. You push start and your initial water in the, in the hot liquor tank on the left gets, filled up, gets heated up to your initial temperature. When it hits that, an alarm sounds. You go, hey, uh, I need to pay attention now. So you put your, your grain into your mash tun. You hit start, starts the mash process, turn on your pump, and then you go have a pint because you've got 60 to 90 minutes to do nothing. Then the alarm sounds again. says, hey, your mash is done. You need to start laudering, which is the process of make, taking the liquid from the middle tank into the right tank before boiling. So you flip on your pump. You push the next button, and then you go have another pint because that's going to take about 40 minutes too. Then, when you're all set, you uh, you can uh, you don't get an alarm here, so you do have to actually pay attention. But when you've got the desired amount of liquid, you push start boil, and since Brew Lab is already uh, pulled in all the recipe information. It also knows about your hop timings and your flavoring additives. So you're now at a manual state there. So all you're doing is waiting for it to tell you, hey, put some hops in, put a flavor in, and you're pushing a button and drinking a pint of beer. Then when you're all done, it automatically turns off the heat so that you don't forget and have had too much alcohol because you've had at least two and a half pints by now. And then you turn on your pump, pump it into your fermenter, and you have finished with the first stage of brewing. And that gets you to fermentation. Fermentation is similar process only on the cold side of brewing. You're focusing on maintaining specific temperature for a very long period of time and monitoring it to make sure that it doesn't have an extensive amount of uh, dips in that. Because yeast is very particular. It what, depending upon your strain, it really likes to stay at a particular range. Most ale strains are sitting between uh, 60 and 72. And most lager strains are sitting between uh, f uh, lagering temperatures are like 32 to 55, depending upon your strain and at what point in it. So it needs to be at specific st uh, temperatures based on the yeast for extended periods of time and the ability to fluctuate that. There's some yeasts, like lagers, for example, that need to be at a higher temperature to start, say 60 degrees Fahrenheit for a few days, and then drop down to lower temperatures for an extended period of time. So you need the ability to control that temperature, be able to adjust it, and also be able to make sure that if things are going crazy, you can uh, correct it as quickly as possible. So let's automate this as well. And that's when we start running into the first problem with using a Raspberry Pi. Um, because you're dealing with a threaded environment, you're not getting as close to real-time connections. So if you have anything that is very, very time sensitive uh, and your algorithms are dependent upon time, they will actually potentially be thrown off and cause a bit of craziness. That's actually part of the reason why Temper took a huge refactoring before I released it, is that when I initially put it in, the amount of time between sensor readings, the temperature would go so it would vary so, so much because it always had to do the math for, uh, for the PID algorithm that the next cycle around would actually uh, have incorrect data and then the information would be completely wrong. So uh, between that and the limited number of GPIO slots also, there's only one pulse width management uh, GPIO slot and only one one-wire GPIO spot on the Raspberry Pi means that if you want to start scaling up into larger systems, for example, right now we run four fermenters, but if I wanted to run 15 fermenters because I have a lot of different ideas and I like beer, um, you're going to run into a problem with just having a small expansion board. So we bring Arduino back into the equation, and Raspberry Pi ships with uh, I2C, which allows you to control other uh, slave hardware devices. And you, it allows you to have the Arduino focus on what it's good at, low-level hardware interfacing. It does temperature sensor in integration. It does uh, easy to work with uh, other hobby electronic stuff. But the one caveat is that Raspberry Pi runs on 3v3, whereas Arduino runs on 5 volts. So you do need a logic-level shifter if you're going to be integrating those things together. So. What I ended up doing is creating Yeastimon. Fun name. Uh, Yeastimon is the culmination of the Raspberry Pi interface to handle uh, the networking, I.O., and the high-level stuff. And the, my Arduino Uno 
handles temperature control, and also I have not only from a monitoring standpoint, I have an active temperature control system that recirculates water. So it actually activates a pump through uh, another solid state relay. And so that cools the, the fermenters down whenever temperature gets too hot. I have an integrated dual stage into the system, but that is something for the future is to be able to have a heater and a cooler to properly regulate. And also, it's, and it also integrates with Brew Lab to send fermentation data. So now you've got from end to end, creating your recipe, brewing, the hot side brewing and cold side brewing. Um, you have uh, logging, monitoring, and information to be able to more effectively create your recipes. All with fantastic Ruby. With the exception of the uh, little bit of code on the Arduino that I have on there, that's actually uh, C++ with the uh, AVR bootloader hacked onto that because I don't like processing. So the future. Uh, I want to add support for solenoid valves because turning on pumps requires me to reach over and flip a switch and then flip the switch off and that's a lot of effort so I'd rather instead completely automate it to run solenoid valves so that the entire system hands it on its own because that gives me more time to drink. Uh, also, I want to switch Bruby over to I2C because it's actually the one that has more complexity going on than uh, Yeastymon does. So switching that over would be nice. Also, since I am opening up a brewery, we're moving to a large, I need to, I'm building a large scale brewery panel that does 100 amps. Uh, it's 115 max capability with six uh, water heater elements across the entire system. So I can really electrocute myself when things go wrong. But most importantly is that I'm opening up Brew Lab to the public, uh, completely free, no problems whatsoever. Uh, I'm hoping to have that up by April 1st. I'm just removing some of the bits that are kludgy that I did because I needed things running operationally quickly. And then uh, Brew Lab API gem I have already written in, and that will be released as soon as this thing goes public. So. That was a lot of information to throw all at once, and I'm sure that it confused it because uh, that's how it rolls. But uh, Ruby plus beer equals good. Ruby plus brewing equals even better. And if anyone wants to talk to me more about brewing or Ruby or anything that I may have screwed up in the middle of my process, let me have a pint first, and then I will talk to you.